insert date. I was asked to speak to you about extinctions, which is not the happiest topic for those of us who love life on Earth. And after I considered the topic, I decided I'll talk some about extinctions past and present, and then I'm going to spend the bulk of the time talking with you and showing you examples of how we can reverse that trend, how we can actually make things better for life on Earth, because that's a far more satisfying topic. But let me start this way. Paleontologists over the decades have gradually calculated that there in the past have been five great extinctions of most life on Earth. The first one was a half a billion years ago at the end of the Ordovician period when there was no life on land. And so these were all creatures without backbones that went extinct. Well over 90% of all the species of life on Earth went extinct in this event. We have a very weak idea of what it was that may have caused that because it was a half a billion years ago. The second was in the late Devonian, 345 million years ago. And about 30% of all animal families on Earth became extinct. This extinction event lasted 20 million years. And there's an evidence for a series of pulses of extinctions. I want to point out something else. When these events occur, it takes many, many tens of millions of years for the Earth to recover a full complement of species occupying the range of ecological niches. So when an extinction event occurs for a very long time, the Earth is quite impoverished. The third one was the end of the Permian about 345, I'm sorry, 250 million years ago. Half of all animal families went extinct. 83% of all genera, 95% of all marine species, gone. And this one, near as we can tell, this was has been called the great dying, by the way. Happy talk. It took about 30 million years for vertebrates to recover on land, as near as we can tell. The most famous of these great extinctions was the one that occurred at the end of the Cretaceous period. Did I miss one? Too much happy talk. I'm sorry. At the end of the Triassic 180 million years ago, we lost 75% of all species. And that one is recent enough that we can actually attribute a cause to it, which was massive volcanism, lots of volcanoes going off across the Earth that changed the atmosphere in such a way that it changed on um, pH of the ocean, it changed temperatures of life on Earth. And acidified the ocean, by the way. And then the most famous of them was 65 million years ago, the end of the Cretaceous, and that's when dinosaurs, as we knew them, went extinct. They had descendants left over as mammals and as birds, but the dinosaurs themselves were gone. Now let's switch to relative modern times. As human beings began to spread across the face of the earth from Africa, one of the things that appears to have taken place is large grazing mammals went extinct. How much of that was the change of climate as we left the Pleistocene? And how much of it was the ability of human beings to hunt? We're not sure, but we know that hunting played a very large role. Right after human beings entered Australia, virtually the entire complement of large grazing mammals, but, set, but for a very few, went extinct. For example, when the Maori arrived in New Zealand much more recently, there were a number of large flightless moas or birds, big, heavy, strong birds. They all disappeared in only a few centuries. Now today we're looking at what many conservation scientists are calling the sixth great extinction. E.O. Wilson has calculated that if the current rate of human disruption of the biosphere continues, one half of Earth's higher life forms will be extinct by 2100. That's the end of this century. 
A recent poll by the American Museum of Natural History found that 70% of biologists believe that we are in the midst of an anthropogenic extinction event right now. Since 1500, more than 320 terrestrial vertebrates have become extinct. Populations of the remaining species show a 25% average decline in abundance. Um, situation is actually even more dire for bugs and other kinds of invertebrates. Um, their population numbers, the individual numbers of animals, has dropped by more than half. This event is so drastic, and human beings have had such a profound impact on the landscape and seascape of the planet that some scientists have proposed that we should declare that we are in an essentially a new era, the Anthropocene, that we have left the Holocene and entered the Anthropocene. Over half of the surface of the Earth has now been converted to human use. About a third of all coral reefs have died recently. About a quarter of all mammals are facing imminent extinction. And we're talking about some of the most iconic animals you can think of. African elephants, tigers, African lions have decreased by 90% in the last 30 years. Rhinoceroses, the northern white rhino, is now incapable of reproduction. The last five animals are too old. Polar bears are rapidly declining, as I'm sure you've all discovered. And this isn't just mammals. About, let's see, about a fifth of all reptile species and about a seventh of all bird species are expected to become extinct in the next several decades. Why is this happening? Probably the most obvious is that we've taken habitat away from the other animals on Earth and appropriated it for our use. There are very few species that um, live in a wheat field. And we're continuing to expand as we do that. We're diverting water from ecosystems for our uses, for obvious reasons. We're also using chemicals that are toxic to a number of other species of plants and animals on Earth. And we can't disregard direct taking either. In Africa in particular, the hunting of wild animals for meat is a significant cause of loss of these animals. People can't afford to buy meat, so they go and kill it. And then most recently, and the one that's probably going to be the most severe, is the result of all that carbon dioxide we're putting in the atmosphere, leading to continued warming and the acidification of the ocean, which is already beginning to affect the ability for some creatures, particularly those with shells, to grow and, and thrive. That's all pretty depressing. And by the way, I have to tell you, me personally, I love the rest of life on Earth, maybe more than I do people. And. Uh, if I were to concentrate on this every day, I don't think I could make it. But I want to tell you there is a happy side to this, and that's what I want to share with you now. And I'm going to stop reading, and I'm going to show you examples just from my agency, the National Park Service, where in little local areas we've been able to re reverse things and actually begin to improve the, improve the health of ecosystems and increase the diversity of life in them. So this is what we're talking about. Ecological restoration, restoring native biodiversity elements, that means plants and animals, removing ones that don't belong there, that are frequently invasive, restarting native ecosystem processes, for example, it may mean taking out dams and diversions and letting water flow as it did originally, restarting natural fire frequencies, trying to mitigate unavoidable anthropogenic stressors as best we can, which is usually working on the boundaries, and building ecological resilience. And now I'm going to just show you some examples. How many people here have spent time in Sequoia or Yosemite or Kings Canyon National Parks? How many of those of you have seen meadows in the mountains? Meadows represent only about 1% of the land area of the montane Sierra Nevada, but their importance is enormous, and they affect a vast area well beyond that. So the loss of even one meadow is a kind of a minor tragedy. This is Halstead Meadow that was undermined when a highway was built across it in the 1920s 
and a culvert was put through the, the highway to allow water to flow, but instead of flowing in a sheet, it converted into flowing into a stream, and as a result began to undercut the meadow. So in 2006, the park resolved to restore it. Actually, one very strong-willed woman named Athena Demetri resolved to fix it. This involved heavy equipment, moving earth, basically re-terraforming that meadow, planting thousands of individual meadow plants to make sure that they grew and not the weeds. There it is, now it's now 2009. Those logs have been laid across to try to slow the flow of the water. And then disaster struck. In one day, that spot had four inches of rain, something that's extraordinarily rare. Decades could pass between events like that. The plants weren't sufficiently established, and the whole business pretty well washed out. After shedding some tears, Athena went back to work. She learned some important lessons, lessons from that flood. And so construction was changed a little different. Now we're up to 2011. And here it is today. And by the way, um, as you, if you can see the highway there at the back of the picture, um, that highway with the culverts has been replaced by a causeway where water can flow as a sheet. And then the entire lower half of the meadow has also been restored. An entirely different example. How many people have ever been to Point Reyes National Seashore, Marin County? A beautiful little spot. I highly recommend it. On that seashore for many, many years, in fact, there still are quite a number of dairy farms. And the dairy farms moved water around to provide drinking water for their cows. The result were, was that a few natural salmon streams were lost. They were put into culverts, they disappeared. Um, they are no longer being used by the farmers, and the park decided to uh, see if we could restore those streams. And this is a second example of using heavy equipment in designated wilderness. Here they're using electrofishing to collect the organisms that are in the stream to put them aside so that they're not killed while the physical engineering work is done. They're going to take out that giant culvert, and eventually what you have is a functioning anadromous stream. Amazing, to me at least, the very first season after this thing was completed, I found little coho salmon swim swimming upstream to spawn. There had been no salmon in that stream for 50 years. How they found it, mystery to me. Here's a really curious example. This is Mori Point, which is down the coast from San Francisco in the community of Pacifica. It's been a whole, this little spot has been a whole number of things, um, including a giant borrow pit and a little city park recreation area. Um, it was passed over to the National Park Service about 20 years ago, I believe. Um, nobody really remembered what had been on this spot. There you are. You can even see the little housing development right next to it. Um, and so the Park Service and its partners had to use their imagination to try to figure out what might have lived there and what it might have looked like. One of the things they did was eliminate this road through the middle of it that was cutting off water flow and replaced it with a causeway so the water could flow underneath and provide a, a very nice walk. That's how you fix a meadow. They dug a couple of ponds. Um, historically, there were any number of ponds in San Mateo County along that peninsula, so although we don't know that there were ponds there exactly, um, it's as good a guess as any. And here's a view of that pond as it begins to recover. The first year after the ponds were filled with rainwater, this little guy showed up, the California red-legged frog, um, a state-listed species. Um, in, let's see, is it in danger? I think it's threatened. And if you can read that graph, it took just a short period of time before these little guys were reproducing like crazy as the number of egg masses went from the tens to the hundreds. And then, about a year after the frogs had, had restored, another endangered species showed up. This is the San Francisco garter snake that eats red-legged frogs. Um, it's a beautiful animal, by the way. So what do you do when one endangered species eats another one? Well, in our case, we just watched. And it's there, both of them are thriving in that spot. This, this Mori Point was a great opportunity to involve high school students and also elementary school students in the physical restoration work, it was added to the curriculum of the schools right, that were right nearby. So these guys are working with mulch. There's some of the school kids, one of them holding a red-legged garter snake. This, the kids themselves created a nursery for growing out 
probably thousands of individual native plants and then helped plant them on the site, as well as removed a whole lot of weedy species. Here's another example. For most of my life, I sort of had assumed that um, palms were always a good thing, a good sign of life. Well, it turns out that in this part of Death Valley, those palms that grow in the springs are not native. They were planted, and they suck all the water out of the spring, so there's no water available for anybody else. So the park resolved to kill off the palms at this one place called Travertine Springs. They burned them as a convenient way of not only killing them, but disposing of them. Again, reestablished the, the natural contours. And what happened when the palms were gone is we had water on the surface again for the first time in many decades. In fact, there's water there even in the middle of summer. Here's an example that's very close to my heart, High Sierra Lake restoration. There are no um, native fish in the High Sierra Lakes, and there are thousands of lakes in the High Sierra above, say, 9,000 feet. But hopeful fishermen carried fish in, brook trout, a rainbow trout, golden trout, and released them in the streams and the lakes of the High Sierra around the beginning of the 20th century. And they thrived. There was a little guy living in those lakes. Actually, it turns out two species of frogs, mountain yellow-legged frog and Sierra yellow-legged frog. And guess what? Trout eat frogs. So in the lakes where there were fish, we discovered that there were no frogs because when the frogs are small, they get eaten. It came to a point where yellow-legged frogs had become very rare. There were very small numbers of bodies of water where they occurred. And so beginning about 15 years ago, um, we experimentally tried removing fish from a small number of lake basins, interconnected place, lake basins. There you can see an example of a lake basin that shows frog lakes, meaning there's no fish, and fish lakes, meaning there was no frog, frogs. And what we did in those lakes is use a combination of gill nets. Here's a fellow laying out gill nets in the lake. And electrofishing in the streams that connected the lakes to produce a fishless body of water. And what we discovered is if there were frogs in nearby lakes, within, say, half a kilometer, Frogs would show up almost immediately as soon as the fish were gone. The vibes must have changed. And so here's one example in Leconte Canyon, where we start out with just virtually no tadpoles and frogs, and you can see how it skyrockets after nearly all of the fish are removed. And although what's shown there is the 95% point, in fact, um, what the restoration team goes for is 100% removal of fish so that they don't repopulate. And this has now been done in only about 3% of the lake basins in the high Sierra. It's a very small number. Um, so for the most part, fishermen haven't complained. After you take away the fish, this is what happens. Tons of tadpoles. Unfortunately, there's another side of the story. About 10 years ago, we discovered that an unknown disease, um, which happens to be called the Trachochytrium dendrobotitis, or chytrid, had invaded the Sierra Nevada and was killing a number of different species of frogs, including those two species of yellow-legged frogs. And what this little graphic illustrates is healthy lakes in green, gradually becoming infected, yellow, and then the frogs die black. It was extremely disheartening. We were losing between 95 and 100% of all the frogs in the lakes that became infected. And as of right now, there is only one lake basin we know of that has no infection. What we have discovered, however, is that if you provide for large enough fishless bodies of water so you can have a large population of frogs, when the invasion of disease hits, not all of the frogs die off. Some survive, maybe it's only 20 or 30 or 40, but some survive and gradually begin to repopulate those lakes. We're hoping if we can repeat this little selection experiment in enough locations, Darwin will wake up from his nap, do his natural selection thing, and will develop resistant frogs. And we've got a heavy array of scientists at a couple of universities involved in this, and they are now beginning to see what they think are the signs of resistance in some of the frog populations. So all is not lost, but it's been a rough ride. It's also depressing to see.
You come back after the disease has hit the next year and you just find hundreds of these dead frogs. That funny looking animal, anybody want to guess what that is? Seal. The title is giving it away. It's called a Pacific Fisher. It's like sort of a weasel the size of a really big cat. Um, once upon a time, Pacific Fishers were all over the mountains of the western states. In fact, they're all over the mountains of the eastern states for that matter. Um, but they have magnificent fur, and fur trappers, for the most part, trap them out. In the particular case of the Olympic Peninsula in Washington, or for that matter, the entire state of Washington, all the fishers have been trapped to zero and they were extinct in Washington. I mentioned, by the way, that one of the healthiest populations of fishers in the West is right above you. And Sequoia National Forest, Sequoia National Park um, has the largest single population of fishers for many hundreds of miles and seems to be doing okay. So anyway, Olympic in partnership with Olympic National Park in partnership with the state of Washington decided they would do an experiment, see if they could restore fishers to the most protected spot in the state, which was Olympic National Park. British Columbia provided the fishers where they're still plentiful. And as I recall, about 40 fishers were trapped in BC and then brought down and released. And in this case, it was an opportunity for some kids to take part and learn something. Those fishers all had radio transmitter collars, and so for a long time we were able to determine whether they were alive and where they were. Um, they're still there. We lost quite a few, but the ones that survived have been reproducing well. Um, the radios have long since died, so what we have to use now are little bait stations attached to trees with a little um, a little wire mesh dip thingy that pulls some hair off the fisher. And then essentially we can run the DNA on the fisher and we can tell what individual fisher it is. Um, every single fisher that was released has been genotyped. We can even calculate when fishers, young fishers arrive in the scene, we can calculate who the parents are. This may be the most significant restoration on the West Coast. Uh, there's a, a river called that flows from the top of the Olympic Mountains into Puget Sound. And for about a hundred years, um, it was dammed with two dams. This is the Elwa Dam right here. And as a result of those dams, what had been um, an anadromous fishery run of coho and chinook and sockeye salmon and steelhead trout had collapsed to next to nothing. Um, which didn't make the local Indian tribes very happy. It took decades, but the Park Service, working with the tribes, was able to convince Congress that it was going to be worth a number of tens of millions of dollars to get those dams out and restore that fishery. There's the Elwa was finally breached. And here's the Lions Dam letting go of all of its water prior to its dismantlement. Oh, I wanted to say a little anecdote about the removal of the dams and the arrival. And by the way, um, we're all already getting thousands of fish spawning, and that's probably going to increase logarithmically. Here's an interesting little factoid um, that was discovered not too long ago. High mountain ranges tend to be really low in important nutrients, including nitrates and phosphates. One of the ways those nutrients are supplied to high mountains is by fish traveling from the ocean, but basically swimming all the way to the high mountains to spawn and dying, or getting eaten by a bear or something else. And then those nutrients are transferred to the ecosystem. And now that we're able to use very sophisticated measures, we can tell that this is an enormously important source of nutrients wherever there are an address of fisheries that are spawning in the West. I've only touched today on a relatively small number of examples of restoration. Um, I was afraid that I might run out of time to keep you long and knew that I would get spanked. Um, so we do have some time to talk. Um, another couple of projects that I've been involved in that I love to talk about are Sierra Nevada Bighorn Sheep. I've been working on those for 35 years and I'm very proud to tell you that when I started on that project there were about 250 sheep in two herds and now there are more than 600 sheep in 11 herds. And although I wouldn't say that they are safe, they're looking a whole lot.
Anybody here happen to notice in the news that there was a recent release of sheep, um, both in Kern Canyon and Sequoia, and also in the Cathedral Range in Yosemite, where there have not been any bighorn sheep for well more than a century and a half? Yeah. Jim. Yes, I did notice that. Oh, <laughs> anybody else? So questions, comments. These are the. Oh. Go ahead, Jim. Oh, I just just to follow up on that. These are the same big horns that when I was a kid I saw in the Tonga Mountains. Is that correct? Different subspecies. Different. Okay. Yeah, and they look. They actually look pretty different. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. This is a pretty specific, but. On the Elwha River, those two dams, what was the purpose of the two dams and how did they get around the, how did they, how, did we, how were people able to get rid of the dams? What the dams were built for hydropower purposes. And when Olympic was made a national park, it began the process of acquiring the dams from private operators, so they bought them. And once, of course, the dams were owned by the government, then um, we were free to remove them. It took decades of conversation because it was going to be so expensive. And like a number of the other restorations that I've introduced here, we really didn't know how to do it. We didn't have other examples, and so we had to start. Um, for example, we didn't know when we were removing the dams that ultimately there was going to be so much silt coming down that canyon for a number of years that we were going to have to supply a separate um, source of fresh water for the communities living at the bottom of the river there. They couldn't use the river anymore because it was going to be full of silt. So we had to build a, a unplanned, had to build a water treatment plant. And could the fish have gone up through that silty water? We didn't think that there would be any fish for a number of years, but they're already doing it. So they're fighting their way through the silt. Like, the conditions are hard, hard, far from ideal. But fortunately, Olympic is a really wet place. And we're figuring that in probably less than 10 years, the vast bulk of the silt will all have been washed out to the ocean and we'll have far more spawning going on. But it's already happening. It's really exciting. Yeah. Where did the communities below the Elwha Dam get their electricity now? It's part of the grid. In other words, you know, everybody's, everything is connected, so nobody really gets their electricity from a single source anymore. It's just part of the network. They weren't a terribly productive source of electricity any longer because those two reservoirs had silted in for the most part. So they weren't they weren't very efficient. And they were also really old. But as you know, the Northwest gets a huge amount of its um, power from hydropower. Yeah? Is there something that we can do as an individual to help? That's an interesting question. Um, Certainly one thing you can always do is share with your elected officials that you're in favor of investing in these kinds of restoration activities. Send a letter to Congressman McCarthy and tell him that you heard about these activities and you think that they're really great. Um, in some cases we have, as, you, as with Maury Point, there are, when we find ourselves in a situation where there's a community nearby, um, we try to engage the community in, in, in volunteer work to participate in the restoration, and that, that's happened in a number of places in the Bay Area where it's really easy to get to the site. You know, it's harder when it's a long drive. Um, actually, this recent Bighorn um, release that we did, which is way in the backcountry, we had a number of volunteers for that. But they were people with a certain measure of existing skills, and they promised not to get themselves killed while they were doing it. <laughs> she brings up a good point. In, in the realm of archaeology, there are the pit projects that the Forest Service and National Park Service put on for volunteers. Is there, is there an organization like that in the biological, ecological community that, that students could sign up for and get a newsletter and find out when there's something happening in their area? The Student Conservation Association has often been involved in restoration work, and when they are, they definitely share that on their newsletter. And although this isn't restoration, another program that's been happening in the National Park System in recent years is called BioBlitz. 
and it's where we designate a 24-hour period and invite all the volunteers and all the academic scientists we can to do a full inventory of all the species of plants and animals from bugs to trees in a particular park. And we just turn loose people. I mean, I think the last bio blitz in Golden Gate had eight or 900 people participating in it. And we bust them to different locations, and, and some of them were in the water, and some of them were in the bushes, and some were on the beach. And almost inevitably, we discover all kinds of species that we didn't know were in the park before we did this. But it's a way of getting people outside and sharing the thrill of scientific discovery and the thrill of conservation, and everybody seems to have a good time. And I imagine Sequoia is due for having a bio blitz one of these days. <coughs> Are you aware of the efforts of the Kern County uh, Audubon Society at the, their preserve in uh, the Kern River Valley? The Butter Brennenberg. And if so, would you please uh, expound on it? Because they have these opportunities for individuals frequently. You know, I'm going to have to admit that I've gotten really rusty. Um, when I was younger and I had more time, and, well, I lots of time I'm retired, but I had more energy anyway, I, I frequently visited the Kern Canyon on Audubon trips, mm -hmm. and they were a load of fun. Started really, they started really early too. Um, but I haven't been doing that in recent years, so other than something that I come across in the newspapers, I'm not sure um, what they're doing. But they certainly have done some remarkable e ecological restoration in the upper canyon there. Um, when I look at pictures from the 1950s, it's really um, miraculous what's been accomplished. Amazing what you can do with water. How does a species begin to go about becoming extinct? Well, they generally don't plan on it. Um, <laughs> I mean, extinction happens when more of that species die than are born in a particular period of time, and then that just continues to happen. So whenever mortality outraces fecundity, eventually what you have is extinction. It could be local extinction, it could be global extinction. Does that make sense? So, it's think of it as, for example, um, I was frankly shocked to discover how much decline had occurred in African lions. I haven't been to Africa in a long time, but when I was there, we saw lions every day. 90% um, decline, well, what's happened? It turns out it's not that simple. Um, a lot of the prey items that the lions eat have been, have been removed by people, shot. So there's not as much to eat. A lot of the hunting land that the lions had has been converted to agriculture, and the Africans don't really like lions eating their cattle. Um, there have been a number of diseases that have been transferred from domestic animals to the prey of lions and from the prey of lions to the lions themselves. Some really nasty things like distemper. Um, that have led to acute decline. So in the case of lions, it's a number of factors. And lions, by the way, have a really high reproductive rate. They're really good at growing out cubs. Um, but in this case, they're being outpaced. And you have an, an animal like um, the African element, elephant, I'm sorry, which is being slaughtered at such a rate that if the rate continues, they'll all be gone in 25 years. That's entirely slaughtered by people for their ivory which, if I remember correctly, is now worth more than platinum. So, I've heard we've been loaning drones to the national parks of Africa to help them track down poachers. Just a quick step backwards. You mentioned, is it the Student Conservation Association? Association, SCA. So if students were interested, they could Google, Google Student Conservation yeah. Association and maybe uh, look in and do some research on their own about getting involved. Yeah. yeah thank you. Yes, sir. Um, is there a way to reach a compromise as far as you know, hydroelectric power um, and, and its effects on the ecosystem? And by a compromise, I don't think... The, uh, if, if you put in a hydroelectric dam, are you going to adversely affect the ecosystem there? Or is there a way that you can responsibly have hydroelectric power? There are certainly degrees. But I remember, you know, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, which was back when dinosaurs were on the earth. Um, that was the era of big dams. Dams were going in all over the West. 
And we were told that the fish ladders and the little side channels that were built would be sufficient for the, the trout and the salmon to go upriver and spawn. I believed it, but it turns out it wasn't true. It was wishful thinking. A tiny, tiny proportion of the original population of fish were able to make it up those dams. I mean, at Shasta Dam today, they collect fish below the dam and they haul them up above the dam because early the fish can't do it. Now, it may be that the, that the um, production of Shasta is so valuable that we're going to live with the loss of fish there. Um, I think we, I'm a, you know, I'm a conservationist, but I'm not an idiot. We're going to need to get electrical power from something. On the other hand, if we keep drying out, I think the whole question may become academic. Um, Lake Mead's not producing very much electricity right now. Yes? One of the best things for encouraging ecological re restoration would be to curtail the overpopulation in the world. Nobody, no organization seems to dare to say it's time to suggest that families have no more than one or two children. In Africa, they wouldn't need to, to kill the wild animals if instead of having one or two if they had one or two children instead of often six or eight? Well, they have six or eight because economically they need them so that a few of them will be around to take care of the old folks when they die. You know, there's a... In fact, I'll use Mexico as the perfect example. Mexico is in the middle of a huge demographic, demographic transition where wealth is increasing, the middle class is growing very rapidly, and the number of children per family is plummeting. It looks to me, and it looks to like to a number of other scientists, that what causes families to have fewer children is to be financially secure and for women to have power and be educated. In fact, I'll share something with you. Um, among my charitable contributions, the largest single contribution I make every year is to an organization that educates girls. And that's done for a very selfish reason, because when girls get educated, birth rates drop. A number of other useful things happen as well. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What's going on with um, marine life in terms of restoration? It seems to be the one area that is affected by every uh, extinction. Well, there's general bad news and local good news. Um, the general bad news is we've basically killed off all the large fish in the ocean. Um, all of it. How many people here ever go to one of the the, you know, the beach towns and go to a, a seafood restaurant and look at the old pictures on the wall. When you do that, you're going to see fish that are much, much, much larger than anything that you've ever seen because we ate them all. We don't let them get big enough to do that. Um, that's the bad news. And things are continuing to get worse. I mean, I discovered when I was in Italy not long ago with my wife that the fish, Italians love fish. There aren't any more fish in the Mediterranean. So the Italians go fishing off the coast of Africa because they've completely fished out their fishery. And the Africans aren't too happy about it. The other side of that coin is there is now a worldwide movement to develop um, protected areas along the coast where there's no fishing. And that's all it takes. Um, well, the oldest one that I know of in California is along the side of Anacapa Island and the Channel Islands, it's, let me think, it's almost 40 years where there's absolute protection. It's only, I don't know, a mile long. <laughs> when you go into that zone, all of a sudden the fish are five times bigger than the ones outside the zone. And that's because they're all 30 or 40 years old and they and fish have a tendency to keep growing. Recently, and very painfully, the state of California, through the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, implemented a whole series of these marine protected areas all along the coast from Oregon to Mexico. Um, they fought the fishermen tooth and nail. Um, these still only constitute, I don't know, 5% of the coastline of California, maybe? But those things are only a few years old, and we're already seeing dramatic increase in population. And I don't think fish are bright enough to figure out that if they swim inside, they're not going to get caught. <laughs>
um, but they're living. And the hope is, and, and some of them are old enough to demonstrate this, that those marine protected areas, when they reach a certain population size, will then be donating fish to the outside. The population will get too crowded, the fish will leave, and there'll be more fish for fishermen. And one of the largest um, commercial fishing organizations in California has acknowledged that now and said that these things are going to be ultimately <coughs> economically to their benefit. So there's a, there's a nice win-win. Um, yes, sir? Have there ever been any adverse effects of an ecosystem restoration? Like you mentioned, um, the, the frog population and then in turn the snake population. You know, I'm sure we've screwed things up plenty of times. I'm just, I'm, maybe I have too much happy talk in my head today because it's Earth Day. Um, this isn't exactly what um, you mean, but in the case of um, reintroducing the frogs to the High Sierra, um, one of the things we had to count on, counted on is there's a garter snake that lives on the High Sierra, and its primary prey is frogs, which means they weren't doing very well when the frogs were gone from nearly all the lakes. We started putting frogs into these lakes, and garter snakes showed up and started eating them. And that's okay to a point, but if you're, if you, if you're spending thousands of dollars to reestablish a population, and the snakes come along and eat all of it, um, there's no more frogs, and eventually there's no more snakes, because then there's nothing for them to eat. Um, so we've been stumbling around with like translocating those snakes to other areas to get rid of them, at least for a while, build up the population. Ultimately, when you have a large of frogs that can handle that level of predation. Um, but it's always a, a problem in national parks where everything is protected. I'm trying to think of an example where we really screwed up. You saw the way things went wrong with that first example in Halstead. We spent a fortune reestablishing the meadow and then it all washed down the canyon. I don't know that there's very much we could have done differently. I don't know how we would withstand a four inch storm. Um, now, of course, the, me the meadow is so heavily knit together that if there were a forest storm, it wouldn't make any significant difference at all. Um, it's, those, those plants are solid and they're well rooted. This yes, probably isn't happy talk, but given the budget in the federal and state levels, how difficult is it to do any of this restoration? And what, you know, just given the budget. It pretty much takes a local champion in Congress to be won over. Um, I mean, I, it, it happened that the um, the chair of the Natural Resources Committee in Congress was from the, um, the state of Washington, and he got intrigued by the Fisher reintroduction. So he sponsored that. That didn't happen to be a particularly expensive effort. Some of these are very expensive. I think the result is that not a lot of them are ever going to happen at one time. It's going to be one here, and one there, and one the other place. And it's going to take strong support by the local population and by their officials. And if there's any kind of significant opposition, it doesn't happen. Yes. Um, the the uh, gentleman's question over here about um, negative effects of introduce, reintroducing or trying to restore species um, made me think of the wolves um, and the different uh, problems that they're having in certain states with, with the cattlemen, I guess, is, is some of the main opposition to um, some of that. Can you, do you, are you familiar with that at all? That's a real, well, that's a real strange one because it, the, if cattlemen lose any, any animals to wolves, they're, they're, they're completely paid for by the defenders of wildlife, so they, they don't suffer any economic loss. That one feels to me like a very powerful philosophical and political issue where quite a significant um, proportion of the populations in states like Wyoming and Idaho and Montana identify wolves with the feds and they don't like the feds and they figure the wolves are all probably secret federal employees. <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, but it's definitely a rough patch. There's no doubt about that. Uh, with uh, wildlife, con uh, con with, with mo modern medical science and uh, wildlife conservation uh, in zoos and stuff, like how, how exactly does a, spe a species go extinct now? Because like 
shouldn't at least like it be possible to, to save like a a dozen or so and to keep the population alive somehow like that? Or how exactly does this? Uh, like you mentioned the white horn rhino. Like how exactly does this uh, a species go extinct if there are people trying to save? Okay, there's a few factors involved in that. One is that if there are there are cases of cooperating zoos in the U.S. and in Europe that are maintaining species in captivity, particularly some frogs that have gone completely extinct in the wild due to that chytrid fungus, by the way, and they're keeping colonies alive. But there's a catch for a an animal. You need an interbreeding population of about 200 to keep from losing genetic diversity with each generation. If you have a smaller number than that, you eventually end up with a monoculture of an animal that's simply not fit to live in the wild any longer. Um, and it's very expensive if you have an animal the size of a white rhino to keep 200 in captivity. In that particular case, there, the, the five remaining rhinos are all in captivity. They just have gotten very old and they're not reproducing any longer. Um, there had been efforts in the past to release zoo rhinos back into the wild, but they were poached so heavily, because rhino horn is viewed as an aphrodisiac in parts of Asia, um, so they were worth millions to be dead. Um, what am I going to say here? Zoos can help, but only for relatively short periods of time. Um, and, and at least for me, as a wildlife biologist, Having an animal only in a zoo and not in the in the habitat in which it evolved is a failure more than a success. It's not zoos don't feel like real animals to me. It's seeing them in their natural environment um, as part of the web of life that that to me makes it meaningful. Um, but I'm not saying that zoos can't serve as short-term arcs. It costs a lot of money. Way back. An ivory. Ivory is, ivory is a tooth that comes from elephants. Rhino horns are made out of, they're actually made out of the same stuff as your fingernails. Um, so they're, they're two different things, but they both end up um, largely in the illicit Asian market. I'm not an economist. I don't know whether that stuff's going to work. I, I know that at least in the elephant conservation business, there's been really intense con conversation of about whether it would be better to make the ivory trade legal in some way. Um, you know, there's, I don't know, hundreds of millions of dollars of ivory that have been confiscated by different governments that are being held, um, that no one's really quite sure what to do with. A bunch of it was burned last year. So, extremely valuable stuff got destroyed. I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer. But I know I want to see elephants in the wild surviving in Africa, and I don't know how we're going to be able to continue to do it. Maybe the best thing is to, as a propaganda campaign, you know, it's largely Asians in about four countries that are consuming this ivory as they become the middle class. And I suspect that very few of them have evil intent, and that if the right propaganda campaign to tell them this is what you're doing, you're destroying this animal, might um, discourage the use of ivory. I don't know. I just do animals. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Um, what was your your own uh, like? Why exactly did you choose this career path? You chose like your own purpose. Well, I'll tell you, it's a really simple story. Uh, when I was in college, I was always interested in nature and wildlife. I'm not just. I was one of those people. I, you know, camping with the Boy Scouts and camping with the Sierra Club, and I always had animals in cages and jars. I had snakes and lizards and. Um, but when I was in college, back when God was a kid, um, the kind of biology that was being emphasized was lab science, and I, lab science wasn't for me. They didn't offer a lot of ecology. So it kinda, I kind of got turned off, and although I took some science classes, I didn't take a lot. I ended up graduating in political science. But as a result of reading Ernest Hemingway, I always wanted to go to Africa. And so not long after I graduated, um, I went to Africa. <laughs> 
I had a friend who was teaching school in West Africa, and I headed his way, and then we crossed the continent together. And as we were traveling through the big bulge of Africa, um, I met a number of wildlife biologists who were studying one animal or another. One of them was studying giraffes. One of them was studying rhinos, as a matter of fact. Um, and I thought, I could do this. I like this is you can make a living doing this. And so I, I talked to them, and they said, go back to school. You need at least a master's degree. Um, and good luck, because there aren't a whole, are a whole lot of these jobs. Um, but I came home, I applied to grad school, and by sheer dumb luck, I applied to a program at Berkeley where one of the professors was the most prominent wildlife biology professor in the United States, Alice Starker Leopold. I was his student. He got every one of his students' positions, and within one year, I was studying black bears in Yosemite lived happily ever after. <laughs> but I admit there's a lot of luck in that. I think we're about out of time. Is that it? Yeah. So I'm going to have to... Are we out of questions then? Yeah. One more. Oh. One more. Last question I think was yours. Yeah. Uh, what ecological benefit do frogs have over fish? In a, aside from the barter snakes. I wouldn't call it an ecological benefit. When, when there are frogs rather than fish, you have a hugely greater different variety of insects living in the water, and you have a bunch of different birds that live off of those insects. You have a, a much more diverse lake with frogs as the center of it than with fish at the center of it. And I think the reason for that is those lakes evolved with frogs, not with fish. If there had been naturally occurring trout for hundreds of thousands of years in those lakes, they would have developed really rich, complex ecosystems too. But instead, these outsiders arrived and ate everything. So. Trout fish, trout lakes in the high Sierra are really um, very impoverished, simple ecosystems. Okay, thank you.